Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the webinar by the TEFL Academy. I can see some names popping in already. It's great to have you all here. So my name is Luan, and I work with the TEFL Academy. I live in beautiful and sunny South Africa, and um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. But while I do so, please say hi in the chat function on the side of your screen. Tell us where you're listening, where you're watching from today. It will be lovely to say hi to you a little later on. So as mentioned earlier, my name is Luan from South Africa, specifically Cape Town. Some of you may know it. I've been a teacher for over 13 years now, and I've taught students from all over the world, all walks of life, all backgrounds, ages and levels. It's been an amazing journey. So I am a teacher trainer and a Cambridge examiner, and I'm very excited to be presenting this webinar to you today. It introduces such vital skills to help you get started on this amazing journey that you're on. So why don't we get going? So let's say hello to some of the people who have popped in on the chat. That is really exciting. I've got Doris from the USA, welcome. I have, I'm going, I, I hope I'm going to pronounce this correctly, Kavivi, and you are from Malawi. Hi, neighbor. <laughs> and then I have Mary from Canada. Hello to you, Mary. Mervyn, you are also from South Africa, from Durban, welcome. And I have Catherine. Catherine is from Canada too. Amazing. Welcome. Johan Dupree from South Africa. A big warm welcome to you too. Robin, you're also from South Africa. Hello to you. And then I have Blue Zitrone. Um, that's the name of the account. I'm not sure. You're from the, U from the UK. Welcome. Um, if I am butchering your names, I do apologize. Um, I've got fr someone from France, Kajo, Kajo, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but welcome, feel welcome here today. And from the USA, wow, so many people popping in. And from the USA, and then I've got, let's see, Mama from the UK, um, M Emma, also from the States, and thank you, happy Saturday to you too, Emma. I've got Lisa from the USA. Goodness me, they do not stop coming. <laughs> Hello from Portugal, that's amazing. Hello, Melvin from Cape Town. And then I have, ah, from the Bahamas. Well, I'm, you know, I live in beautiful South Africa, but I would love to be in the Bahamas right now. And then I have Ritma from Latvia, amazing. Greca from Sardinia, Italy, amazing place. And then Kate from Texas, um, Taz Nima from France, hello. Uh, I've got Alejandra from Colombia, hello. Karina from the UK, Siska, Siska, hello from Cape, no, from, let me read, from Cape Town, yes. Serendia from the USA, hello. Karina, welcome. And it doesn't matter if you're only on unit two, this webinar is for anyone at any point in the online course. It doesn't matter if you're on unit one or right at the end, or even if you've finished your course and you still have access to the platform, you're absolutely welcome. Uh, Robert, hello from the UK. I've got Lois from the UAE, hello. Clinton from New Zealand. And then I've also got Nishalen or Nishalen from I think I've got KZN, that's in South Africa. So a big warm welcome to you all. It's amazing to have you here. And today we're going to be looking at something very important, teaching vocabulary. But what I've got to point out is that when we do go through the webinar, you're very, very welcome to ask questions. Please enjoy every part of the webinar. Save your questions for Q&A, but I will only be answering questions relating to today's topic. This is very important to note. If, however, you have questions outside of today's topic, that is not a problem. We're not going to leave you in the lurch. You can absolutely contact Tutor Support, and we'll be more than happy to assist you. All right. Also, something very, very important to note is that there will be, let me just put the, the screen on so that you can see, there will be a rebroadcast 
of the English for Academic Purposes webinar immediately after this webinar finishes. So if any of you missed that or couldn't access um, the relevant information around that webinar, it is going to be available directly after this webinar. So you click on the link on your dashboard to access this webinar at 5 p.m. UK time. Enjoy that webinar too. Loads and loads of useful information. So why don't we get started with today's webinar, which is all about teaching vocabulary. When it comes to teaching vocabulary, we think about all the words in the English language. And you know, our students start off very excited wanting to learn all these words. And of course, it's a lot. It's a lot to convey. So we break things up. We make it more realistic for our students, but also more realistic for us as teachers to teach vocabulary. And when we think about vocabulary teaching, there's a lot to consider, but we've got to remember that vocabulary is made up of lexis. And what is lexis? Words and phrases. We teach words, we teach phrases, we teach collocations. Um, we teach fra full phrases like, for example, not my cup of tea at the end of the day, um, the long and winding road. Those are all examples of phrases. And think about it. If you're learning English at a very basic level and you hear someone using a phrase or an idiom or metaphorical language, it doesn't necessarily make sense to you because at that stage, you're still translating in your head word for word. So those phrases are hard. Even though individually those words are simple to you, put together they mean something entirely different. So phrases are fun, but sometimes a little tricky to teach. And then of course, collocations, as I mentioned earlier, like fast food, fish and chips, happily married, my check account, all those are examples of collocations too. All right, and then I've, I've, got to, I've got to say hi to a couple more people. I've got, I think it's Elena, Elena from Virginia, and also I've got hello from India. Welcome if you've just joined. All right, let's hop right back in. So the first technique that we're going to look at is something that is so important to me as a teacher, and that's eliciting. So, you know, I don't know what your idea of eliciting is because it can be quite a broad term, but in TEFL and in vocabulary teaching, it means to get information from your students rather than just giving that information away. And that very often means the actual word. If you're about to teach them a brand new word, instead of saying today's word is and then giving them the word, no, try to get the word from them. Why do we do that? I'll tell you a little bit later on, but that's what eliciting entails. Trying to get that information from our students rather than just giving it away. So eliciting involves asking questions to assess what your students already know. And it's not a magic formula. It's not that our students always, you know, that there's always someone in your class that just knows the word. That's not the case here. But eliciting shows you what they already know. And this is an amazing process to use as a teacher. So we can't assume that they don't know the word. And some TEFL teachers may have been, ex uh, sorry, sorry some, some TEFL students, some EFL students may have been exposed to the vocabulary at home, through a relative, the media. Our learners get vocabulary from everywhere. So in a vocabulary lesson or as a pre-teaching stage, to a reading or listening lesson, we can't just assume that they don't know the words. No, this is why we also elicit. So one of these many techniques that we use as a teacher is eliciting. And it's a range of techniques used by teachers to get information from students. And it gives your students the opportunity to come up with the vocabulary themselves, to come up with the meaning of the word themselves, the ideas, and the associations. So already you can see that through eliciting your lesson or that part of your lesson where you're teaching the vocabulary becomes a lot more student-centered than teacher-focused. So already we've touched on a couple of reasons as to why we use eliciting. So let's look at a few more reasons. If you elicit 
your student your students are more engaged you avoid a group of passive listeners think about a lecture where the lecturer is just talking and giving information well gone are those days if you use the technique of eliciting also it makes the content of your lesson a lot more likely to be remembered Students can make the association with the context or examples and therefore remember the words just so much more. Teachers can assess what students already know, as explained on the previous slide. And teachers can adjust the lesson to the students' needs. Uh, teachers need to be flexible, of course, and we, we need to feel and read the audience. Are there signs of boredom, yawns, misbehavior, blank stares? I think that's my favorite one. All of these point to the fact that the students are no longer focusing on the lesson content. So the teacher needs to go back and find the misunderstood words before continuing the topic. This is so, so very important. I think the biggest thing for me is, as a teacher, I don't want to leave students behind. All right, so we've looked at a few of the reasons as to why we elicit. And the next thing we're going to look at are a few eliciting methods or techniques, right? So there are several ways of eliciting. And if we have a look at the example we've got on the screen, this morning I was late. The bus left five minutes before I arrived at the bus stop. What happened? I, and I like when I elicit, I like to write I and then I leave a gap and I write the bus and I see if my students can fill in the word missing there. Remember, I'm trying to elicit the word missed, for example. So think about it. Your students might, might say things like, I lost the bus, or I, you know, they might come up with a variety of things. But you know what? Lost is not the word I'm looking for. Lost is not technically the correct word. But what does it tell me? It tells me that my students are on the right track. And this, for me, is just as important as ultimately getting that word from a student in the classroom. I hope that makes sense. All right, so let's move on to the next slide. And we often use pictures to elicit. I love using pictures, particularly if it is something that is difficult to elicit with words. Now, missing the bus, not necessarily difficult to elicit with words, but a picture says a thousand words. And what else do pictures do? They reduce your TTT, your teacher talk time. So here, if you look at the screen, a very, very clear picture of what's happening. Bus is leaving, mum and kid running behind, kid has missed the bus. So a very effective way of eliciting is using images. Um, and also, if you think about using images, there are other ways. With abstract con uh, concepts, yes, you might use an image or another method, method like a role play. Um, often a role play helps. You can use yourself and another student. Um, this is very effective. And then ask the rest of the class, what do they think is happening here? Look at this exchange. How do you think we feel? And then see if the students will actually give you the word that you're looking for. All right. And also, when we use a role play, um, it's also interesting because our learners become really engaged. I find that particularly with my younger learners, if I'm about to do a role play or if I'm about to, you know, act out a little scene and I want that, it also really engages them, gets them involved, and they very often give me the word that I am looking for. So let's think of a few more methods that we can use for eliciting. And something important to mention before, sorry, before we move on to that, and actually I saw a question relating very much to the next slide, so hopefully what we're about to do will answer your question, but let's think of a few more ways that we can elicit. So another way that I like to use is the face, so facial expressions, body language, uh, to role play or mime a more abstract concept using other eliciting techniques, asking students to, to think of, um, you know, things around the topic that you're about to, to introduce. And if any of you 
in the webinar today have got any ideas around eliciting techniques, please punch them into the chat function and we can absolutely have a look at them a little bit later on. But other techniques that you find would particularly be useful in a classroom with which to elicit vocabulary or if you've been a student, not necessarily in English, maybe a different language class and your teacher used a technique that was really helpful, please put it in the chat box. All right. Another another um, eliciting technique, and I'm not very good at this one, is drawing. So you can absolutely use drawings and you can use these to to jog a student's memory. And if you think about it, two meanings here, physical drawings. I'm terrible at those, but also drawing out memories, helping them to think of something in the past that would possibly um, come to the table and bring forth that amazing word you're looking for. All right, so lots, lots of similar categories we've got here, expressions, you can smile, scowl, yawn to, to, to you know, explain boredom, um, a really angry face to, to get anger. Maybe you're looking for the word furious. So there are just so many ways, so many physical ways you can elicit the words. And then something a bit more wordy, synonyms and antonyms. You know, if I say to you, right, I feel angry, but it's more than angry. I am more than angry. So there's that synonym, angry. But I'm telling you, it's stronger than angry. What, what word do you think I'm looking for? So your students might give you the word that you're looking for, or if they don't, well, there you go. You can, un, you can, you're on the right track, and your learners are giving you ideas that tells you as a teacher they're following. All right. So I hope that helps because with eliciting, I find that my lesson immediately just becomes a lot more student-centered. My learners are part of the process. They're building that word with me, and tomorrow when I test them or the next day, they are more likely to remember the word. And that just makes me feel good as a teacher. All right, so let's move on. Okay, so we're looking at vocabulary teaching methods. And that first one there, to translate or not to translate. Now, when it comes to translating, it can be very tempting to translate or if you are fluent in the student's mother tongue or even just competent, um, it's very tempting to use the student's mother tongue to explain a concept. But encourage a classroom where English is spoken, only English. Give them that total immersion experience. This improves, improves fluency. And also get yourself into the habit of of expecting English, and I'll tell you why. Sometimes you'll be teaching students where everybody speaks the same first language, and other times you'll be you'll be teaching a language class where there are students from various countries speaking various languages. So it is better to totally immerse them into that English experience, have them speak English, have them survive in English in your class. Remind them, of course, that it is okay to make mistakes but have them speak English. All right, and then the very next point is language grading. So when, for example, you're teaching an A2 level class, and an A2 level class is a pre-intermediate class, so fresh out of elementary into that pre-intermediate level. So in the bigger scheme of things, still relatively low. And if you have an A2 level class, when you elicit, you've got to use language lower than their level. At, yes, but preferably lower than their level. So yes, you're teaching them a word above their level as we very often do in a vocabulary lesson or in a reading or listening lesson. We teach words above their level because think about it, they're going to read that text later on. Find those words and get very confused if they haven't learned them in advance. So you, you teach above level words, but to elicit that word, we use our language, our speaking has got to be graded at a lower level. We are going to be looking at the CEFR levels a little bit later on in this webinar. So please don't stress if they don't sound familiar to you or even if you've never heard of them before, because maybe you've just started the course. But I promise you getting to know them the CEFR levels will certainly help you as a teacher. I know it has me. 
All right, so if we think about, uh, we're still on vocabulary teaching methods, create a context. A context often helps students either give you the word you're looking for or even just understanding the word you're trying to explain to them. Think about it this way. If you're watching a movie in another language, what helps you understand what is going on there? The context. So a context is useful. Um, and words can mean different things in different contexts. So, the so you as a teacher must clarify the meaning in context. I was um, I gave my students a reading not too long ago, and the reading was done by a journalist. Um, the text was written by a journalist, and she introduced herself saying, I write a column. So this word column has got various meanings in English. It could mean those pillar-like structures that you see on buildings, but it could also mean a piece of text written on a regular basis in a magazine or a newspaper. The latter is of course what the journalist was referring to. So when I teach that word, just before my students are going to read that text, I teach the word in that context so that when they read it in the text later on, it makes sense to them. You will have students asking you, but teacher, doesn't it also mean this? And then say to them, absolutely yes, because in English, words could mean various things, but in today's context, that is what it means. All right, so, Let's have a look and expand a little bit with context. And remember, please, I see amazing questions being popped into the chat. I will absolutely answer your questions. We will have a Q&A a, Q, a, Q a a little bit later on. But yes, please pop those questions in or hold on to them right until the end so that we can answer your questions. All right. So let's look at context. So I'm going to show you a few examples and I'd like you to think about which of these examples would be most likely to help students understand the meaning of miss the bus. Now this might seem so easy for us as teachers, miss the bus, but think about it. Miss could mean various things. Um, so what we're trying to teach them is that we missed the bus as in we arrived, bus had left. Right, so let's have a look at these examples. A. I missed the bus this morning. I arrived at the bus stop two minutes after it had left. Look at the second one. I was annoyed because I missed the bus. Quickly punch into the chat. Or even if you don't want to punch into the chat, just think about it. Which of these two context sentences clearly explains the phrase, missed the bus? I missed the bus this morning. I arrived before, before, sorry, I arrived at the bus stop two minutes after it had left, or I was annoyed because I missed the bus. What do you think? Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of A's coming in. Wow, we, and yes, you're absolutely correct. Why not B though? Let's think about it. The word annoyed tells us I'm angry, I'm not feeling so good about the situation, but so many things annoyed me. So that, that won't tell me that they understand miss the bus. The first one is a stronger context. So if you've punched A into the chat, you are absolutely spot on. All right, so another thing that we've got to think about is vocabulary teaching and what is important during a vocabulary lesson. And I'm sure that those of you who have opened the course material, you will have seen MFP. MFP must be covered in a vocabulary lesson. Meaning, form, pronunciation. So when we practice vocabulary, the first thing we aim for is accuracy. And this can be practiced in a worksheet, like a gap fill task, word slash definition matching task. And then later in the lesson, we aim to facilitate the development of fluency. That stage where you give them a speaking task and they now get to use the vocabulary in a more natural way, deciding where, when, and how to insert the vocabulary that they've just learned. An amazing stage. All right. Okay, so the very next method, and this is probably one of my favorite methods, is concept checking. And we use this technique, as you can see on the screen, to check understanding. It's a method used by a teacher to assess if the students understand the meaning of that word in context. A very important technique, and I'll tell you why. 
When we ask concept questions, we check understanding, but we avoid a very specific question. And we're going to look at that in a second. So here we go with I missed the bus. Which of the following is the most appropriate concept question? Do you understand? Did you get to school on the bus? Did you arrive on time? Why? So very quickly, again, just like you were the first time, you were fast. Type your selection into the chat function. Which of these three concept questions you know, I say concept questions because not all of them are concept questions, but I missed the bus. The teacher wants to check whether or not the students have understood what that means. So there we go. I missed the bus. First question. Do you understand class? Very, very tempting, right? Did you get to school on the bus? Second question. Did you arrive on time? Why? Now, the big reveal is that B is the most effective concept question. Now let's have a look at A. Why do you think it is not effective to ask students whether or not they've understood? If, if I explain and I say, do you understand? Why does that not work? Any ideas? So to help you out there a little bit, when we say, do you understand? Students often say yes. They, are, they say yes because they don't want to look silly in front of classmates, maybe. They say yes because deep inside they feel they've understood. Or they might be a bit afraid to acknowledge to the teacher that they don't understand what was taught. So that one there is not very effective. It's a loaded question. It's a dangerous question because if you ask your students, do you understand? They say yes. You move on to the next portion of the lesson. Finally, when you've got to test what they've learned, they can't produce. All right. And then we've got C. Now, C might not clarify the meaning of the word missed because they might have got to school with a, with a friend, a lift. They might have asked mom to take them, dad to take them, a friend, a colleague. So here we, the, the whole concept around the word missed is not clarified because they might give you many, many questions. And with concept questions, here's the big keyword I'd like you to take away. Actually, a few big keywords. They've got to be graded, they've got to be simple, and they've got to be closed. In other words, not too many options with answers. Keep your answers really, really focused so that you can clearly see by the way they answer, they've understood or they've not understood. So I missed the bus. Did I get to school by bus? And if they say no, then you know, okay, they, they're clearly on the right track. I love concept questions, please use them. But remember, after you've elicited the word and clarified its meaning, ask a few concept questions. Don't only ask one. Don't make them vague. Keep them, keep them closed and keep them graded. And I promise you, in a classroom, it's really going to help you as a teacher to fine tune your teaching. All right, so we move on. And I'm sure you've heard about language grading, not only in this webinar today, but also in the course. Those of you who have not heard of it before, it's all right. We're going to explain it to you briefly today. So language grading is very important. You've got to select the words you use when eliciting and concept checking. Don't introduce a more difficult word uh, when explaining a concept. So if you're already explaining a word they don't understand and you use equally difficult words to explain that word, to concept check it, to elicit it, they go completely lost. It is a very common error that new teachers make. I know I made this mistake in the past. It's something that takes time, experience, and research. So when it comes to language grading, I'd like you to think of it like this. They open up a dictionary because they're looking for the definition of a difficult word. Think about it. We go to a dictionary because we don't know what the word means. They open up the dictionary, and that word is explained with equally difficult words. Does that help them? Absolutely not. So remember, it's the same when speaking to your students. So we teach words that are above their level. That's why they don't know the words. 
because they're above level, hence the need for teaching. But when we elicit those words and concept check those words, our language grading has got to be lower. Very important. If you take away nothing else today, take that away. All right, so I promised you earlier that we'll be looking at those CEFR levels. So what does CEFR stand for? The Common European Frame of Reference for Languages. And if you look at them briefly, A1, beginner. Beginner is often called elementary. And some schools, some language centers even divide that into true beginners and false beginners. Then we have after beginner with A2, which is pre-intermediate, as I mentioned earlier. And then we have B1, which is intermediate level. B2, which is upper intermediate, but they are on the verge of advanced. I would say for me personally, in my experience, B2 is more of an upper intermediate level. And then C1 is advanced and C2 is proficient. Yes, we still have C2 students. The students who need to fine tune their English in order to enter a certain profession. Students who are relocating to another country and need a C2 certificate. Students who want to enter an English speaking university, for example. So yes, you can still very, will teach students that are at C2 level, have a dictionary on hand. There are often words that I don't even know in a C2 level course. Have fun with that. All right, so let's have a quick little quiz. Just your feeling, right? So remember earlier, A1 beginner, A2 pre-intermediate, B1 intermediate, B2 upper intermediate, C1 advanced, C2 proficiency level. Right, let's get your feels. What level are the following? A1, B1, and C1. I've been to Paris three times. My name is Fernando. I live in El Bonito. I'm not certain that you really understand this concept. So let's look at the first one. A1, B1, or C1? What do you think? And you can punch your answers in the side in the chat. All right, I see some answers coming in. All right, all right, so get your head around that. So you've got uh, some of you are saying B1 for the first one. What about number two? My name is Fernando, I live in Il Bonito. Anything there? Yeah, yeah, all right, so let's have a look. So I've been to Paris three times. It's a B1, that, that, that's what a B1 speaker would sound like. That present perfect tense is there and that they learn at B1 level and sometimes at the end of A2 level. My name is Fernando, I live in El Bonito, very basic, my immediate environment, simple tenses, that's A1 level. And then here we have really built and, and, and scaffold and, and filled um, language, I'm not certain that you really understand this concept, C1. So absolutely the final one is C1. I think that's so interesting. All right, so when students learn new words, they need to record vocabulary. This is quite important. So recording vocabulary is an interesting process because it helps your learners to remember the word. And you can use word cards or a vocabulary notebook. I love telling my students at the beginning of their learning period with me to get a vocabulary notebook, to write down words and make notes of what they mean. And also think about what is included for each word when students record. Some of them like to translate. This is dangerous because words do not necessarily translate well. They translate directly sometimes, but not the way words are used in English. So let's look at what is included for each word. So on the screen, you have an example of a word card for the word ghost, and then some surrounding information, parts of speech, pronunciation, collocations or words that are connected to the word ghost. So you'll see that your students can build something like that. It does two things. It helps them to remember what the word ghost means, but also expands their vocabulary with little additional bits and how we speak about ghosts. I believe or I don't believe in ghosts. What is a place called with lots of ghosts? Haunted. So absolutely, word cards are so useful. So give them a dictionary task and tell them to create their own word cards 
Or if you teach them new words, tell them for homework, create word cards for five of the words you learned today. It's a useful task and it's a great study tool to help them in future activities and tests. So when recycling new vocabulary, and this is something interesting for me, a student needs to use new vocabulary five to 16 times, and in some resources, you'll see 17 times before they know it. That's a lot of repetition. So five to 16 times before they actually know the word. So don't be surprised and don't be impatient when you've taught them a word on Wednesday and you want them to know it on Thursday. It's not likely to happen. So how do we encourage students to use new vocabulary? Because remember, using it more often cements it. So how do we encourage them to use it? Ways we can uh, re recycle new vocabulary, word games crosswords, word searches, things like I spy, matching activities, speaking and writing activities. These are all very useful when it comes to recycling new vocabulary. All right, so I will absolutely attend to your questions right now, but I'd also like you to note that all our previous webinars are available on the TEFL Academy YouTube channel. And if you've got any further questions outside of today's topic, you can absolutely ask a tutor support. But right now, I am going to actually answer some of your questions. Now is the time when I will address some of the existing questions that we've got in the chat, but also if you've got something that you would like to, to ask me about, you're absolutely welcome to do so. I know that some of you wanted me to go back to the previous slides. That's not a problem. But as this is a live webinar, remember, we go through the slides, we answer questions at the end, but you're more than welcome to access these webinars and the slides um, on our YouTube channel. So if you've missed anything or if something did occur a little bit too fast, we're not going to leave you in the dark. You'll be able to find these webinars. All right, so now we have Q and A, and I will absolutely answer your questions. Just a reminder on the rebroadcast of English for academic purposes, that webinar is immediately after today's webinar here with me. That's 5 p.m. UK time. All right, and you'll be able to find this webinar on your dashboard. You just click on the YouTube link and you'll be able to join. All right, now let's get to Q&A. All right, so I know that some of you have got questions. I know that um, some of you have asked me to go back to a previous slide. That's absolutely all right. I will answer as many questions as I can right now. So I'm just scrolling back because I know that as we answered some of those little uh, tasks that we did earlier, some of you also started putting your questions on rather early. So let's see, I'm going to show Karina. Karina, you asked, is this correct? Teach above level words, but use illicit language and examples lower than their level. Absolutely, yes, Karina. So say for example, I have a B1 level class, or my students are B1. I've given them a reading, and unfortunately in this reading, well not unfortunately, it's fantastic, there are some B2 level words, some C1 words. If I want them to read that piece of text and understand the text, they've got to learn what those words mean before they read. So now I aim to select words that are higher than their level to teach them. But yes, Karina, when I elicit those words and when I concept check those words, the language I use with which to convey meaning has got to be lower. It's got to be simple. Why? Because the most difficult thing they're learning today is that new word. Everything else, the way we explain things, it's got to be simpler. I really, really hope that that answers your question. All right. And then also remember, please, if you are wanting to ask questions and you please, you can type them in now. I will get to as many as I can. Um, I've got another good question here from Tasnima. 
how to encourage students not to translate directly. I have some adult students who directly translate words to their L1. Yes, this is a very, very common occurrence. Now, Tasnima, what I would say, during a teaching session, when you're eliciting and concept checking words, I would tell them, put your translators away. And I'll say, it's not because I don't want you to use them. It's not because I don't want you to access words on them. I just want you to understand that sometimes when we translate, the word gives you either an incorrect translation or it gives you a direct translation. And that's not necessarily how we use that word in English. So I very often tell students, put the translators away. You can use them later if you wish, but we first need to understand what this word means today in context. It is very tempting. They pull those translators out all the time. And as Nima, some of them are good the translators, and some of them are not so great. So it's a little risky allowing them in class. So tell them the translators are okay to use outside or when you do your homework, but just to understand the words I'm teaching you today, let's focus on the board, let's focus on the slides and see if that helps. But I feel your pain. All right. And then I've got... Um, and then yes, so many of you punched in um, some ideas around why students uh, say, yes, I understand, or no, I don't understand. And concept checking is so much better. So thank you so much for your comments. All right, and then another good question here from Mary. Do you still need to grade down to elicit for C1 or C2 learners? So remember, Mary, when we're teaching a C1 class, right? Class level is C1. So we're most likely teaching words above their level, which means it's C2 level words. So the way we explain those words and the way we elicit those words and the way we concept check those words, yes, I would bring it down below their level, of course, accurately so, but so that the meaning of that word is very clear. So remember that even C1 and C2 learners need you to grade your language a little bit lower. Of course, you've got more variety of the different levels and tenses that you can use when speaking to C1 and C2 learners. But I would say, yes, still grade your language, even for C1 and C2 learners. All right. I hope that's clear. All right. And then... Um... At what level can students think in L2 without translating in your head? When you find when you find out, let me know. I know that various students have this experience at various times. I know that me, for example, I'm trying to learn Italian and I very often still have to translate and I'm sort of like an A2 learner. So it's definitely not A2, but it happens for various students at various times. Um, I would say that for me, in my experience, B2 level learners, they stop translating in the head. B1 level learners are still going back and forth a little bit. A2, A1, still very dependent on what the structure or the word is in their language, translated and then produce. I would say comfortably at B2 level. In my experience, that stops happening, or it, at least it starts to, to reduce a little bit more. All right, and then um, I had one request. I'm just trying to go down. All right, um, please, can you go back to the first recording, the first recording of new vocabulary slide? All right, I will do my best. Is that the one? So I'll, I'll just briefly show them. That could be it, yes. So that's the first recording new vocabulary slide telling us that we can use word cards, a notebook. And then the next slide was recording vocabulary and what kind of information is included when we record new vocabulary. That is the next slide for recording new vocabulary. A student needs to hear the word five to 16 times. Can you believe it? And then also, a little bit on how we can encourage students to use new vocabulary. And those are some of the examples. Word games, crosswords. I love giving them speaking activities. If, I, if they've just learned weekend activity, 
vocabulary, then I'd like to say to them, right, now you will plan your weekend with your friend and the two of you will speak for about four or five minutes. Think about all the fun things you like to do and talk about that. And then very often the vocabulary just comes out in a nice natural way. And that's a great way of recycling new vocabulary. I don't focus too much on the other mistakes that they're making because the focus, the main focus is the vocabulary that they've just learned. All right. So we're back to Q&A. And I think that there are a few more questions down below. Wendy, you're very welcome. Thank you for making things interactive. Absolutely, they've got to be, right? We're teaching in today's webinar how to make vocabulary learning interactive with your students. So yes, absolutely very important that today's webinar mirrors that. All right, so we've got a great question here. What is the best way to teach abstract words in your opinion? So I think, sorry, the, the writing, I'm, I'm assuming Elena, I'm not sure. When it comes to abstract words, of course, it's those words that are difficult to explain, those words that are difficult to check understanding. And that's when concept checking comes in very, very handy. So I had to teach the word, what was it? Um, isolated. I had to teach the word isolated, a very abstract concept, nothing you can really explain very easily. So what I did was I showed them a picture of a house very far away from everything else. And I asked them, um, tell me about this house. Tell me, do you see other places around this house? Do you see lots of people? What are some words that come to your mind when you look at this house? And, you know, then they eventually came up with lonely, far away. And someone came up with isolation, interestingly enough. So there it was, a very abstract concept. Then I heard school. That's easy. Boarding school, slightly more abstract. So again, it was something that had to be um, elicited and concept checked. Um, something else was a convoy, traffic jam, right? So lots of cars. That's what it, what it looks like on a picture. But that's a very unique concept. It's a traffic jam. So again, I use imagery for, for abstract concepts to at least get their ideas around the word I'm looking for. And then please, Elena, when you are checking understanding with an abstract term, you cannot ask them, do you understand? That is a dangerous question. Concept check that word. A convoy, for example, is it one vehicle or many? Are they traveling together? Are they going to the same place? Is the traffic in the morning a convoy? So ask them a few questions like that. And with abstract terms, ask many concept questions. Ask as many as you think you need to as a teacher in order to gauge their understanding. Great question. Okay, so here's a, a nice idea, I think. I introduce a vocabulary box for my students and they ended up writing the meaning in their L1 after the first day. I end up with 50 cards in the word box. How to use the vocab box effectively. So Tasnima, it sounds like this is something that you use in your class. So my understanding is that students write, um, that they, they put words in the box or they put the meaning in the box. Um, it sounds like a tool that you use in your classroom. And I think that as teachers, we find these tools and we find these ways of really, um, you know, recycling and using and explaining vocabulary. And if this works in your class, I think it's fantastic. But I think I need a little bit more information here to understand exactly how this works. So if you don't mind clarifying, we'd love to know more about that. Absolutely. All right. And then I've got a fantastic question from Tasnima too. And Tasnima, I love this question because I love the phonetic of, I love phonetics and I love the IPA. Is it necessary to write the pronunciation in phonetics in the uh, in on word cards when the levels are between A1 and A2? So Tasnima, this depends on when you've started introducing the phonetic alphabet. Now with A1 students, I will admit I don't use it. I start using the phonetic alphabet a little bit higher up. Um, you know, with my B1 students and up. as a teacher, you can make that call. If you see that your learners are feeling comfortable with the IPA and they're getting the hang of it, then you can absolutely 
um, introduce it at a very low level. If, however, you feel that your class is struggling a little bit with vocabulary, basic vocabulary um, learning, then I would say save it for a slightly later stage and teach vocabulary through drilling and stress and word stress, sentence stress, um, choral drilling, individual drilling. So I would say rather than focus on pronunciation in that way and leave that off the word card and then later on introduce it. I put the IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet, on my wall in all my classes. Whether I'm teaching an A1 class or a C1 class, it's there. It's got a presence. So my students are exposed to it at a very early stage. They start asking questions, they start paying attention, they start using it. Some of them are so kid friendly as well with pictures and so on. So Tasnima, I would say experiment, put it on your wall and start introducing it slowly. See how they feel about this. It really is such a useful tool. All right, um, another question, let's see, from Karina. How do you encourage students to practice speaking using new vocabulary when they're learning from their homeland where they don't have the opportunity to practice outside the class online with you? This is a difficult one. I think this is a particularly um, big problem. If, for example, uh, you're teaching online, I have a student like this. Uh, she's in Germany, she's older, she's at home, and she's learning English with me. But there's no one in her immediate environment to talk to um, in, in English. So what I do is she's got time and I often give her, I know it's not the same because you're, you're looking for speaking practice, but I keep them busy with other activities, writing activities, listening activities, vocabulary uh, practice activities. Um, sometimes I ask them to tell me about your day, send me a voice note. Um, so I, I, at least there's an element of communication until that next lesson. It's a difficult one. What I've also done with some of my online students is I've put them in touch with each other. So they can actually have little coffee dates during the course of the week where they get to chat. So they literally meet students from all around the world because I'm the common teacher, I put them in charge, I give them the Zoom address or the Zoom link and they meet up a couple of times a week and they practice their English. This is something that you might want to look at at a later stage. It's a lot of fun because sometimes I join the coffee dates. All right, teacher gate crashing. Okay, so this is a great question from Bronwyn. Hi Bronwyn. Can you have a class consisting of a mix of levels or will you have a class of A1 or a class of A2? So Bronwyn, in most cases, you will have students that are all in one similar level in one class. I mean, I cannot imagine the chaos of having an A1, a B2 and a C1 learner in one class. So what most language schools do is when students arrive at a school to learn English, they do a placement test and the placement test will tell you in which level they are meant to study. And then they are all put into one class and into another class, into another class. So they will all be of a similar level in your class. However, this is down to the school and the resources they have. They might have classes where the levels are slightly mixed, but they won't be extreme. It won't be A1 and C1. It might be some A1 and A2 students or a nice mix A2 and B1 students. That's a rather common mix if they are mixing students. But I will say in most cases, Bronwyn, one class, one level. Great question, by the way. All right. And you're welcome. Those of you who are saying thanks, absolutely welcome. Please, please, please ask questions. All right. And then let's see. I think I might have missed one or two. So I am... Tasnima, I actually think you asked exactly the same question as Bronwyn. Um, you asked how to teach vocabulary when you have a class with different levels. It's not likely that you will. In most cases, language schools, primary and high schools, in most level, it really is counterproductive to put students of drastically different levels into one class. Imagine you're studying an, another language and you get put in and you're a beginner and you get put into class with advanced learners. It's not going to help you. It's going to be chaotic for the teacher and the teacher won't be able to plan lessons effectively anyway. So it's really, really not common that students are put into one class being very, very different levels. All right. I hope that answers your question. 
All right. Okay, so if you've got any questions, please punch them in right now. If you don't, no problem. If you've forgotten anything or if, you if you're like me and you remember something at 3 a.m. in the morning that you wanted to ask, please remember that we are accessible and available on tutor support. Our turnaround answer time is relatively fast. And if the tutor on duty cannot help you, believe me, we've got others who can and resources that we can um, that we can look to to answer your questions. So please, please, please ask your questions. All right, so I've got one more question here that I think we can answer. What other names are used to describe the CEFR levels? All right, so when we look at the CEFR levels, they're standard A1, um, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2. And sometimes, as I mentioned, earlier, A1 can be referred to as elementary. Sometimes students are referred to as beginner. And then you have A2 level, which is pre-intermediate. Then you have B1 level. Now, B1 is that comfortable mid-ground. So, B1 is that intermediate level. B2 is upper intermediate, sometimes borderline advanced. C1, comfortable advanced student, C2, proficiency level. Those are the key words that we associate with the CEFR levels. And just to remind you, CEFR, Common European Framework of Reference for Languages. I hope that clears it up for you. All right, any other questions? Now is your moment. We've got a few minutes left and I'm more than happy to answer your questions. And those of you saying thank you, you're absolutely welcome. It's exactly what we're here for at the TEFL Academy. We want to help you. So ask questions now. And if we can't get to them today, we can absolutely ask them, answer them on tutor support. All right. And those of you, a final reminder, those of you who joined a little bit late, there is another webinar immediately after this one, but you don't hang around here waiting for that webinar. You've got to join on your dashboard. The link about um, the webinar that did not happen the other day and you'll be able to access it. So immediately after today's webinar, that's 5 p.m. UK time, you'll be able to join. All right. And you're absolutely welcome. I'm very happy you enjoyed the presentation today. Just one thing before you go. Let's just see. Right, so we've done Q&A. And now, just one thing, please remember our survey. So the survey is something very important because the survey is where you can tell us what you think of the webinar and also ideas that you feel are useful to have in our webinars. We really, really want to help you. So please, if you've got any ideas that you would like to see presented in these webinars, you can absolutely ask us um, in the survey. There's a space where you can tell us what you think and the survey is the place to do that. So again, thank you very, very much for joining. It's been wonderful spending this hour with you. I hope to see you all back and more when we have our next webinar. And if you're joining the next webinar at 5 p.m. UK time, remember to access it on your dashboard and enjoy it. All right, have a great weekend, everyone. Oh, you're so welcome. Absolute pleasure to all of you. You're so welcome. Have a good one.